today we're going to continue talking about privatization of core government functions, and our central focus is going to be on prisons and the military. I'm going to start just by uh, revisiting the basic outlook of privatizing government that became so powerful in the early post-Cold War years. We'll then focus first on privatizing the military in general, and that'll lead us into a, a discussion of the host nation trucking uh, example in, from Afghanistan, about which we put together that case that was on the syllabus. Um, then I'm going to give some background on the U.S. prison industry, and that'll lead us into a discussion of the privatization of prisons um, and what we should be thinking about um, more generally about privatization of core government functions. Just to put my map back up on the uh, screen, this is from last time, uh, we distinguished post-communist privatizations from what I was calling neoliberal privatizations, part of the, the uh, small government gen agenda at home and the Washington consensus abroad, and distinguished previously public or public sector nationalized industries, so things like railways um, and utilities, from um, the wielding of public authority as we spend quite a bit of time on eminent domain. Uh, and then we left for today what I'm calling core government functions, policing, prisons, the military, things that have to do with ba people's basic survival, uh, the, the state's co monopoly on the legitimate use of coercive force, to use uh, Max Weber's definition of a state, policing, which we're not going to talk about, uh, though uh, I, I should perhaps have mentioned that uh, in the one of the one of the consequences of the um, private privatization of um, the provision of local services in housing, the common interest developments, uh, in many respects, they also have uh, some privatization of policing. Um, there's an old joke about what are the Yale police for, by the way, and the answer is, was to protect the students from the New Haven police. We had a kind of, uh, one could make of that what one will. But I should have uh, gone a little bit further that in, in, a, in a sense these, these um, common interest developments are gated communities. We tend to think of gated communities as communities only for wealthy people. Uh, gated communities around Cape Town, uh, where, uh, uh, or around actually any of South Africa's cities, where wealthy people live and they have their private law enforcement. But uh, one of the interesting features of the common interest developments in the U.S. is that 60 million people live in them, and they're of, of many different income categories. But they are essentially a kind of gated community, even if the gates are, are often uh, invisible. Um, so today we're going to go to core government functions. And uh, just to take us back to how people were thinking about privatizing government, let's go back to December 1994. Our Reinventing Government Initiative, led by Vice President Gore, already has helped to shrink bureaucracy and free up money to pay down the deficit and invest in our people. Already, we've passed budgets to reduce the federal government to its smallest size in 30 years and to cut the deficit by $700 billion. That's over $10,000 for every American family. In the next few days, we'll unveil more of our proposals, and I've instructed the Vice President to review every single government department program for further reductions. I know some people just want to cut the government blindly, and I know that's popular now, but I won't do it. I want a leaner, not a meaner government. We can sell off entire operations the government no longer needs to run and turn dozens of problems over to states and communities that know best how to solve their own problems. My plan will save billions of dollars from the Energy Department, cut down the Transportation Department, and shrink 60 programs into four at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. A new government for the new economy, creative, flexible, high quality, low cost, service-oriented, just like our most innovative private companies. 
So he wasn't talking about uh, shrinking government to the size when it could be drowned in the bathtub, as Grover Northquist uh, would subsequently uh, argue. Um, but it was very much, he went on in that speech to say, we propose to stop doing things that government doesn't do very well and that don't need to be done by government. Um, so there is, there's a sense that uh, uh, we should be looking everywhere we can uh, to privatize what government does. <coughs> um, this really had started in the 1980s uh, with Reagan, but it accelerates in the 90s with, uh, with, with Bush 1 uh, in the Clinton administration, and we will see, uh, particularly under George W. Bush, uh, the privatization of core government functions starts to really take off. Um, in 1993, this is the National Performance Review called uh, that the Clinton administration conducted. They, they called for aggressive outsourcing of government work. It led to the elimination of almost half a half a million jobs in the federal civilian workforce. Um, and interestingly, by 2001, this is the beginning of the Bush administration, the Pentagon contract workforce outnumbers civilian Defense Department employees for the first time. Uh, those who can remember back that far, this is when Donald Rumsfeld um, was Secretary of Defense, and he um, he made it his business, this is before 9-11 uh, happened, he made it his business to rethink the whole structure of the military much more on private sector principles and to slim it down. And so if you look at the, at the US government workforce over the past two decades, you can see that the, the, the size of the number of employees working directly for the federal government doesn't really change that much, and by uh, some measures it, it decreased. Uh, th this purple line is what we call grant employees. Most of that is grant money given by the federal government in block grants to state and local governments or for specific projects, and you can see that that, that had uh, continued to increase, but after the financial crisis, um, it, it tails off as well when, when, uh, I sus when government uh, comes under real fiscal stress. My guess is that this, this little peak in the first couple of years uh, after the financial crisis was stimulus spending, things like NIH spending uh, and others, which then tailed off. But the, but the notable fact in the be beginning decade of the century is this massive increase um, in the number of uh, contracted workers. This is contracting out of work. And a big chunk of that increase that you can see there in the, in the blue line, also up through 2010, was outsourcing in the military. Um, this is courtesy of, of uh, Rumsfeld and his successes. But the, the, the idea that we would rely much more heavily in the private, on the private sector in all of the operations of the military. It's a big part of that, um, that surge that you see uh, up through uh, 2010. And even then when it falls, it, it goes nowhere near where, where it had been before. And I suspect, uh, for reasons I will get to later, that if you have these numbers through 2019, this will uh, increase. Okay, privatizing the military. So um, the idea that there are private contractors involved in the conduct of war is not new. If you go back to the Revolutionary War, you can see that actually in every single war, we have had private contractors and mil military personnel involved all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Um, they, they are the yellow uh, bars rather than the blue bars who are a regular military. And you can see um, that they've, they've had a rather small presence in most of those wars. The, the largest uh, proportionately 
before uh, the Iraq War being um, in, the, in the Civil War and in the Second World War. But uh, the Iraq War is notable because for the first time you can see that we have more or less the same number of private military contractors. This is by 2008 in Iraq, and you can see um, basically we have um, more or less equal numbers of private military contractors, unlike the first Gulf War, which we talked about in the very first lecture, where the coalition forces were almost half, half a million people, even though um, we didn't uh, engage in, in regime change. We had a much more ambitious agenda in the, in the 2003 Iraq War, uh, even though we used many fewer of our own uh, troops and we relied much more on these private military contractors. The Afghanistan war uh, takes it to a whole new level. This again is, is, is 2008. Uh, you can see this is, we, we were drawing down troops in Iraq uh, after that, and the, this is the, the surge in Afghanistan that starts at the end of the uh, Bush administration, continues under Obama. and. Uh, the private military contractors become less of a proportion of the total during that surge, although we will see later that uh, in, the, in the decades since then, the picture is somewhat different. So you might be asking yourself, well, who are these private military contractors and, and what do they actually do? Are they, is, this, is this just a euphemism for mercenaries. Um, mercenaries are as old as the hills, after all. And at least as they are employed in the US uh, or by the US, they're strictly not supposed to engage in frontline fighting, uh, the offensive fighting, but they can do just about any other function. And they do a huge variety of things. So just to give you some sense, uh, just this is a, a, a flavor of some of these companies of their size and what they do. Here's one called G4S. It has about 625,000 employees, mostly involving uh, itself in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it, you can see it does a whole gamut of things, routine security, banks, airports, and prisons, but more heavily armed security, mine clearance, military intelligence and training. Another one, Aranese, mostly in Africa, although uh, it's, it's had a lot to do in Iraq as well. It guards oil pipelines. It has about 16,000 guards, so it's, it's considerably smaller, um, but working, or it, it, was, it has worked almost everywhere in Iraq, often, often protecting um, commercial ventures such as iron ore, oil, and gas projects in the Republic of Congo. The Asia Security Group, uh, a smaller one, about 600 guards, but uh, b it's been very active in Afghanistan, particularly security for the high, high government officials. It's had millions of dollars in US contracts and uh, uh, protected supply convoys in Afghanistan South, about which I'll say more in a little while as well. DynCorp, or DINCorp, not sure how they pronounce themselves, pretty, pretty big sized one, uh, 10,000 employees, uh, 3.4 billion in, in revenue, uh, again, operating in many parts of the world, Iraq, Africa, uh, Latin America, Eastern Europe, uh, it's become involved in, in, you might think of as policing missions, anti-drug interdictions, um, uh, disarmament of, of uh, fighters in uh, stalemated civil wars, uh, a whole variety of activities. Triple Canopy, have interesting names, some of these uh, companies. Eight, about 1,800 people mostly from Uganda and Peru, and they, they're making uh, contracts worth about a billion and a half uh, a year. Involved, as you can see, in countries as different as guarding the US Embassy in Haiti, um, uh, 
protecting U.S. personnel in, in Israel and many other things. Aegis Defense Services, a very big one, 5,000 staff, UN missions, um, peacekeeping missions sometimes, uh, and it's been involved in emergency response uh, for governments, risk assessment activities, so the whole gamut, gamut of activities. And so this, um, this is a particularly notable um, military contractor, changed its name several times. It used to be called Blackwater, and it was one of the most notorious um, of these, particularly because it had, was famous for very aggressive tactics. Um, it, it's big, it's, got, uh, some, it's had some 20,000 people working for it at different times. Uh, as you can tell, um, many parts of the world. It got notorious mainly because of Iraq in uh, two different episodes in Iraq. One was that uh, it precipitated the, the, battle, the first battle of Fallujah uh, in 2004. The army had it, it not intended to take Fallujah, um, but four Blackwater uh, per security personnel got themselves killed and it went viral, their bodies, hang, their burned bodies hanging from bridges in uh, Fallujah, um, for, basically forced the U.S. to redirect its plans and go and take Fallujah, uh, which they had not intended to do. And this is one of the ways in which uh, military contractors can actually affect the primary missions. Uh, but then um, several years after that in Baghdad, uh, Blackwater shot and killed uh, 17 civilians, including a nine-year-old child, and uh, much of this was uh, also went viral, as had the Fallujah episode, uh, and, and eventually uh, f four of them were, were convicted of murder, and uh, one got a uh, life sentence, two other, the other two got very, uh, very strong, uh, I think, 30-year criminal sentences. So Blackwater became synonymous with these freewheeling, uh, uncontrollable uh, military contractors, which actually had, um, had an effect in thinking about uh, how they should be restrained and governed. There was something adopted called the Montreux document the following year by 52 countries, including the US, that listed a whole series of uh, good practices. Um, and uh, said, among other things, that the governments employing them would be uh, accountable for what they did. Of course, the, like many of these kinds of protocols, whether they can be enforced is another matter. Um, but so Blackwater then has renamed itself twice, first to G Services, and, and now is called Academy, or Academy, I don't know how they like to pronounce themselves, but um, m most people who have heard of any uh, of, these, of these companies have heard of, of them. Um, so that's the kind of thing that they are. As I said, they do, they'll do virtually anything. They will fight for any, any government uh, if, if the price is right, and they will largely do whatever they are asked to do. The personnel in them have changed a lot. Um, for instance, in the 1990s, a lot of them were former South African military after the settlement in South Africa. Those people now are pretty long in the tooth, uh, probably too old for this kind of activity. And um, so uh, they come from all over the world. Um, but it, in certain situations, and particularly we'll see in Afghanistan, there's very heavy reliance on local uh, populations as a source uh, of employees by these companies. So let's talk a little bit about host nation trucking in Afghanistan. Um, they were my, these are the convoys you can see that they were um, uh, employed to guard. Um, and it's important to say a little bit about why this came to be the case. 
So this is a map of Afghanistan. As you can see, it's a, it's a, first thing to notice is it's a landlocked country. Um, I haven't got Kabul marked on it, but Kabul is right there pretty much. Um, and for reasons we're going to talk about when we get into the, the class about the global war on terror, the US went into Afghanistan after the, 2000, uh, the 2001 attacks with a very light footprint. We, had, we went with very few troops on the ground. In fact, um, the way we fought the war in Afghanistan was to get behind one side in an existing civil war. Uh, there had been a, an ongoing civil war in Afghanistan between the ruling Taliban and a group called the Northern Alliance. And the Northern Alliance was all but defeated uh, in 2001. We wanted to uh, do Afghanistan on the cheap, for reasons I will talk about later, and we made the judgment that the way to do Afghanistan on the cheap was to get behind the Northern Alliance. And the idea was to, to help them win the Civil War uh, so that they would then become a government that we could work with. Um, and that is exactly what we did. But the, the thing we didn't think about, or certainly we didn't draw the right um, conclusions, if we did think about it, is that if you get behind the losing side in a civil war, it's probably going to be the case that that government is going to be having a hard time governing. Uh, because this, there are probably reasons why it's been the losing side in a civil war. It might not have a lot of support, for instance, among the, the population, or it might not be able to create on its own a Weberian monopoly of the use of legitimate power precisely because it doesn't have that um, capacity. And so indeed, um, we, the, we did help the, the Northern Alliance win. We defeated the Taliban and we put them in power. Um, we may have seen them as a government we could work with, but of course, a government that comes to power that way, it is, is inevitably going to be seen as a, an American puppet government on the ground, which tended to be what happened. And so, basically, people, you know, you, you'd read article after article, and if you would interview people, you would, you would hear statements to the effect that the, the government in Kabul, for years, didn't, um, didn't, you know, you could, once you're five miles outside Kandahar, um, really the, the, the government had no real control of the country. Um, and so this was the reality in which this ongoing war uh, was being prosecuted. And indeed, as we will see when we, we dig into the, le in the lecture on the global war on terror, um, by 2003, uh, many of the commanders on the ground in, in Afghanistan were advising up the chain of command that uh, the Bush administration should be trying to make a deal with the Taliban, uh, perhaps, perhaps to create a, a government of national unity. But the, 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 the judgment on the ground was that there was no way uh, the, the government we had put in place was ever going to, given the resources we were spending and, and so on, was ever going to become uh, a legitimate and effective government. That argument was systematically either ignored or rejected, and we we're, it's now, of course, the longest war in American history, and um, we are on the verge of doing a deal which will return the Taliban to power. So this was the world in which we were operating for much of the, the first two, uh, two decades. We were basically supporting a government that didn't control its own territory. And we had a very light footprint. And so the, the challenge was how to move supplies around Afghanistan, which is, was essentially uh, not secure. In particular, this Highway 1, which you can see goes uh, basically around the country. And, um, 
we had to be able to move personnel and particularly equipment through this hostile territory. And that was not going to be easy to do. And so you can see what happened um, at the start, um, in two, well, not at the start, but in 2007, we had um, about 24,000, 25,000 troops there and um, a more or less equal number of military contractors. Um, you, you can trace these numbers up through the surge, but by, uh, you know, uh, six years later, um, we, had, we had inc we'd brought these troops from Iraq and then drawn them down somewhat, but our reliance on, on military contractors continued, so we're, they vastly now, uh, in 2013, and this has continued since we've drawn down troops further. So we've been heavily reliant on these military contractors. And basically what we've done is used them to guard convoys. Uh, the, the reason we wouldn't, why wouldn't we want to use American troops to guard these convoys? Any, why would we want to contract out the guarding of these convoys? Pardon? What, what kind of cost? The, the financial cost. Uh, there's some financial, yeah. Well, we don't have the draft anymore, so uh, as far as we're able to... We don't have a draft, so that, again, we have to use professional soldiers. That can be expensive, yeah. They, they understand the terrain better than the U.S. troops. Uh, that's also true, but it, ca it comes with a sting in the tail, which we'll talk about a little in, a, in a few minutes. But, but the real reason goes back to the lack of a draft, that uh, this is really hostile territory, and if we had started using a lot of American soldiers to guard these convoys, we would have started having a lot of American casualties. And ha st having a lot of Amer American casualties would have made this war much more difficult to fight because people would be calling their Congress people, their senators, and you know, uh, it, you don't have to th think that far back to see how this played out during the Vietnam War. It was when large numbers of Americans were being killed uh, that the support uh, for fighting the Vietnam War went away. So the idea was not to expose politicians to the political cost, um, to the, not to expose them to the political cost uh, of having a lot of soldiers there. But the, the difficulty with relying on people who know the terrain a lot better is that they also know how to take advantage of you, right? And so um, we, were, we, we had a lot of contradictory imperatives because we were trying to pacify the country. We were trying to help the government get control of the country. Um, so, for instance, among other things, we, we put in place rules which said that private contractors guarding military convoys couldn't have more weapons more powerful than AK-47s. The problem was that these convoys were being attacked with rocket-propelled grenades. Um, so uh, how are you going to actually protect the convoys if you, if you don't have the relevant firepower? Big challenge. What's the answer? Don't fall off the trucks. Pardon? The material falls off the back of the trucks. Uh, and how do you do that? The answer was money, right? The answer was money. You basically had to, you, you had to pay the people who might otherwise be attacking you not to attack you, right? So there were, so there were huge shakedowns. Um, and I, I've, these are from the case. I put them on the slides, not to read them out to you now, but you can look, peruse them at your leisure. But they're basically, um, whistleblowers and others reporting uh, what the, the going cost was uh, to make sure 
that a, a convoy didn't, uh, uh, didn't get attacked. And so um, the Taliban was charging $500 per truck from Kandahar to Herat, uh, and the different prices listed there. Uh, this is a, a slide from a presentation to a congressional committee which basically said in order for the ho host nation trucking contractors to be able to work in the Sharana region, they had to basically pay $150,000 a month. Um, so, it, and th this became scandalous because it turned out as you, it would, shouldn't take you too long to realize that we were sawing off the branch we were sitting on in that we were actually funding the guerrilla movements that we were supposed to be fighting. Um, and, the, and the reason was that uh, we, were, we had to essentially pay uh, in order to um, in order to be able to prosecute this war uh, with, with the uh, reduced cost, economic cost, that when you're not uh, sending professional, uh, well-paid U.S. military in the hundreds, tens and hundreds of thousands, and avoiding the political cost that would have uh, come with doing it with our own troops. Um, so that became a huge scandal, and there were a lot of hearings uh, about it. Um, and uh, some of the problems were fixed, but it remains something of an ongoing problem. Uh, but what the question I want us to puzzle over is, assuming that the problems could be managed, and we'll come back to uh, whether they really can be uh, in, a, in a little while, but assuming the problems can be managed, and it really is uh, more efficient to fight wars this way. It really does save money, and, and it, it saves lives, and you, you, you know, it's a market solution. You're letting people uh, who want to spend their lives taking these kinds of risks take the, those risks. Um, it means we can fight what would be otherwise unpopular wars. Is that a good thing? No. It's anti democratic. It's why is it anti democratic? Wars are popular. It's a war that should not pass uh, through a legislature that has gone through the public. Well, let me be the devil's advocate there a little bit. He's saying it's anti democratic because if the war is unpopular, uh, we shouldn't be fighting it. But when we fight the war this way, it's not sufficient, it's not unpopular. Um, right? We were, we're contracting out to people who want to fight the war, and we're getting to stay home and uh, not have to send us, our, ourselves or our sons and daughters to die. So it's, it's not, it, it would be an unpopular war if we were sending them, but we're not sending them. And we're only sending small numbers of professional soldiers. Yes, sir. There could actually be perverse incentives to fight more wars. It creates a perverse incentive to fight more wars. Yeah, if something's cheaper to do, you're more likely to be able to do it. Um, what's so wrong? What's so bad about that? So the, the, um, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, you find some of the same sentiments as we're hearing from the floor here. People, there was a great nervousness, these huge, huge debates about whether we should be having standing armies at all, because standing armies want to fight wars. Um, and maybe it should be really difficult uh, to fight wars, and we shouldn't fight wars unless there's a lot of support for fighting the wars. Yeah. Uh, you got to yell or get a mic. We, I forgot to get the microphone. Yell. You just got to yell. carry out some of the, the missions that they carry out. 
So you're worried about uh, these, these armies going rogue and doing their own thing, yeah? Okay, yeah. I would say that the problem is not so much in the war in itself, but what is the oversight? So we've seen that in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, rather than the Congress declaring a war declaration, that's been done through giving power to the president to the war. So if there's no oversight of how the war is, is going on, then we can have this rogue armies we were talking about. So it's sort of, undem this, it's sort of undemocratic because there are no checks and balances on the war itself. Okay, so we'll come back to the oversight issues, but the, the, the argument uh, of the Federalist Papers and um, the resistance to having uh, professional armies in the first place was, was the idea that uh, you know, war is not a great thing and we should only, I think part of the idea was we should only be fighting wars that we really need to fight. And if you, can, if, if, you can, if you really need to fight a war, you'll be able to mobilize the citizenry. And if you can't mobilize the citizenry, maybe it's a war that doesn't need to be fought at all. And we'll come, we will consider later whether there was another option in Afghanistan after 9-11, a path not taken. But the, the other thing uh, to think about is there's a literature in political science and political philosophy that goes all the way back to Immanuel Kant, uh, who first observed that what he called liberal regimes, or what we think of as today as more democratic countries, tend not to fight one another. They tend not to fight one another. And this is, turns out, Bruce Russett, who's now an emeritus professor here, is very famous uh, for having studied this empirically at great length, Michael Doyle at Columbia, uh, a political theorist who spent a lot of time on this, but many people have studied this so-called democratic peace. And the, the, it, it seems empirically to be the case that democracies tend not to fight one another. Um, and also, uh, at least until recently, uh, that democracies tend only to fight wars that they're going to win. Uh, which again depended upon the idea that it's going to get people, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get people to fight uh, unless a war is really important to them, in which case they'll be motivated to win. Um, and so if you, if you start to make it uh, very cheap for politicians to wage wars, as we have done increasingly by reliance on uh, first a professional military and now military contractors, and increasingly, uh, we're going to be relying on things like drones, which can be also fought without very many soldiers uh, and at, perhaps at very low cost. And we are funding these wars on debt. Uh, we're not actually making people who, who live and vote today to pay taxes to fight these wars. Um, it's going to make us more warlike. Uh, because uh, we don't have, politicians will not have the incentive to avoid war. And so the, the, the finding, the empirical finding in the democratic peace literature might start to go away. Let's shift focus to prisons, and then we will come back and see what these two have in common. So um, some summary points about prisons. And the, the main big one is that we are a huge outlier in the world. Um, so here you can see incarceration rates um, per 100,000 of population. And the US beats everybody, hands down. Um, we have, uh, this was um, in 2012, uh, but the picture doesn't look substantially different uh, comparatively. We uh, have over 700 per 100,000 citizens. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the Czech Republic, which comes in next, has 200,000. If you look at the top 10 incarcerators in the world, you can see what kind of company we're in, even though we dominate them all, Russia, Belarus, uh, countries of that kind. South Africa comes in 10th, but we're all, you know, we're not quite double, but we're there. And, and if you want to look at it over time, you can see um, that it really has accelerated in the last 
for, since the 1970s. It's accelerated by a, a phenomenal, phenomenal rate, uh, particularly for males, and we'll uh, see particularly males who are not white. Um, now, some of this has to do with developments in the criminal justice system, but not all of it. Um, so just to, to provide some larger context here, um, in the 1960s and early 70s, there were big advances in the treatment of psychiatric uh, disorders, so-called um, um, mood disorders, things like depression, started to be treated with drugs like um, lithium, uh, and, its, and its cognates and um, thought disorders like schizophrenia started to be treated with drugs like Thorazine and its derivatives. And that meant that people who had previously spent their whole lives in mental hospitals started to uh, be released. So if you go up to Connecticut Valley Hospital in Middletown or Creedmoor Hospital, State Hospital in New York, what you, the first thing that will strike you is there'll be, in, and this is true in state hospital after state mental hospital around the country, there'll be six or seven buildings, the majority of which are boarded up. Um, and the reason is that these people were all deinstitutionalized uh, in very large numbers, uh, people who might otherwise have spent their lifetimes there. But it also happened to occur during a massive fiscal crisis for a lot of state governments. Um, and this is the, the, the dark side of what we sometimes call fiscal federalism. And so as these state governments were uh, saving huge amounts of money by deinstitutionalizing mental patients, where were they going? They were going to, in Connecticut, they were going to, you know, to Hartford, to New Haven, to Bridgeport, um, and the state governments, when we're not giving those resources to the cities, because uh, they were so, the state governments were so strapped, and a lot of those people wound up uh, in the criminal population and wound up in prison. So I'm not saying it's a, a causal argument or anything like that, but there are part of this pro part of this population was fed uh, by. Uh, the fiscal federalism and the fiscal crises of the states um, that led to uh, a, an increase in the population that was likely to be very vulnerable to winding up in prison. So they went from one total institution to another. But as you can see here, the, the numbers are staggering and that's only a small piece of the story. Um, so here's the here are the bigger pieces of it. What drove this? Um, two, two big developments. One was the war on drugs, which begins in the Nixon uh, administration in 1971. Um, and then secondly, the, the, in the 1980s, the massive increase in uh, mandatory sentencing, which shifts power from judges to prosecutors because the vast majority of prison sentences are negotiated plea agreements with prosecutors uh, and led to things like um, the three strikes and you're out rule. So you connect, if you're convicted of a third felony, uh, you get a life sentence. Even And there are all these famous cases of the third felony being a bounce check or something of this sort uh, might not be violent, a violent crime at all. And so these two developments uh, were largely responsible for the much more uh, punitive uh, turn in uh, criminal sentencing and the massive expansion uh, of our prison population to over 200, uh, over 2 million where it is today. Big racial component to this, the, particularly in the war on drugs, the crimes that were more heavily uh, punished and criminalized, the drugs that, that were, the drugs for which people were convicted at higher rates tended to be the drugs used by minorities, but there were other reasons um, about which, which one could teach an entire course uh, about why uh, 
minorities are disproportionately locked up in the criminal justice system. Uh, you can see here, this is 2009, um, the percent of males, uh, adult males incarcerated and, the, and African Americans and Hispanics are much more widely represented. Um, this, of course, has a political dimension because we have so-called felon disenfranchisement laws. Many states have laws. Again, you can peruse this slide uh, at your leisure, but the, the reddest are the most punitive. So, th for instance, in, in Kentucky and Virginia, you're permanently disenfranchised uh, if you've had a felony conviction. And then these, uh, these, other, um, these other colors, the, as they get uh, lighter, it's easier to get your voting rights back once you have served your time. Uh, and if you look at uh, this contributes to the disenfranchisement of minority populations because um, the, 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 here the reddest states are the ones in which um, African Americans are most heavily disenfranchised as a result of uh, felon disenfranchisement laws. So we've become much more punitive. Uh, mostly because of the war on drugs and the much more, much more uh, punitive sentencing policies, particularly um, the move to uh, strong mandatory sentencing. But the big paradox is violent crime, crime has actually been falling. Uh, violent crime has been falling. Um, this is from 1993 to 2017. Um, and this is, um, this is breaking it, the first two graphs are breaking it down um, uh, first by people and then by age. And the second two um, are property crimes um, per 100,000 people or per, or per 100,000 households. And, and you can see that the, that the number, uh, the proportion of uh, convictions for violent crime on, in all of these categories has come down substantially. Um, so uh, we're locking up more people. Uh, this is from 1990. The red line shows uh, the number, the prisoners per population, but violent crime is coming down. So why might that be? Why, why would we be locking up more people? Why would we be seeing locking up more people and violent crime coming down? Drug crimes are largely nonviolent. Pardon? Drug crimes are largely nonviolent. Okay, but we're locking up. Um, okay, so we're locking up people for nonviolent crime. That, that could be one of the reasons. Why else might we be locking up more people with violent crime is going down? Yep. Pardon? The, 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 the criminals are in prison. Yeah. So, so some would say, well, that's great. The policy is working, yeah. right? We're locking them up. That's why the crime's going down. Some people would, would say that. Any other reason somebody might come up with? Yes, sir? Contractual agreements with private prisons. Contractual with private prisons. Uh, we'll talk about private prisons. They are, they are significant, but they wouldn't be significant enough to explain th this development. And uh, the private sector prison increase is a relatively recent. Yeah? Could it be that the police departments are changing their tactics and more community policing is effective? M more community policing. Well, we've seen, we have some experts on community policing in this room, but I believe the short answer is we've had a, we had a rise and fall in community policing, even though community policing um, is more effective. Uh, it, it's gone up and down. Um, maybe it's having a comeback now. Among other reasons, uh, one, is, one reason violent crime is going down is demography. Uh, the vast majority, the, one of the best predictors of violent crime is males between the age of 18 and 24 in the population. And as the baby boom bulge has moved through, um, 
we have fewer, we have relatively fewer people of that age. So some of it is just demography. Um, there's a theory uh, that I has been very controversial by the people who wrote Freakonomics, which uh, purports to show that uh, Roe versus Wade is responsible for the decline in violent crime on the hypothesis um, that those likely to commit violent crimes uh, are not being born because of uh, being aborted. Uh, very controversial. Uh, I think uh, the data was questioned, uh, much criticized, and in the last couple of years they've done a whole series of new empirical studies purporting to, uh, to, purporting to defend their hypothesis. But uh, if, you read, if you read Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which traces the decline in violence in Western, uh, in Western countries uh, over the last seven centuries, uh, he puts a lot of stock in the education and labor force participation of women and uh, argue that uh, as that goes up, violent crime decreases. So the, the, point, the point of the slide being uh, why violent crime has decreased is not a subject about which there's much consensus. Uh, and there are these, and you could, you could probably put up a number of other possible contributors to that. But more interestingly, from the political point of view, is uh, the, that even though violent crime is going down, most people don't know that. So the, the dark blue line is percentage of people in polls who believe that violent crime is increasing. Uh, as you can see, this is the, the, the light blue line is the, the rate at which uh, violent crime is actually occurring. And you can see this pretty big disjunction, an increasing disjunction between what people believe and what's actually going on. Um, and that's quite remarkable. Various hypotheses about that. A political scientist by the name of Stuart Scheingold, who's worked on this, a book called The Politics of Law and Order, argues that it's being tough on crime is cheap talk for politicians because the politicians who can run and get elected on it are often not the politicians who have to justify paying to lock up the felon to voters. Um, so, so, for instance, um, People running for federal office can run on being tough on crime, but the vast majority of prisoners are actually in state prisons that are paid for out of state budgets. So um, coming back to this slide, one thing I didn't point out earlier is that you can see that around the turn of the century, uh, this all started to tail off, uh, that in fact we started to see declines in incarceration rates. And um, part of that was cost. Part of it was uh, perhaps recognizing the inefficiency of punitiveness rates. But if you look at private sector prisons, they are increasing. So you can see that they went from being about 6.3 in 2000 to 8% uh, of the population in 2000 nine, and they're well above 10 percent now, um, so perhaps even more than that. So the, the private sector prison industry is getting at a, an, an increasing proportion of a declining population. Uh, and so that's, you know, violent crime is going down, the number of people locked up are going down, and yet we are seeing this growth and flourishing of the private sector prison industry. Last week, there was a terrific article in the Financial Times about how U.S. states are looking to privatize their prisons in order to close their gaping budget deficits. It turns out selling your prisons to private contractors is a great way for cash-strapped states and even the federal government to raise money. First off, there's the money up front. Private firms will pay as much as 10 to $30 million per prison. Last month, Ohio sold one for 73 million bucks. And Arizona recently finished a series of hearings on a plan to add thousands of privately operated prison beds. 
But the real money comes from the long-term cost savings. Since private companies can operate prisons at a much lower cost than state governments. The reason? It's not just the magic of capitalism at work. It's really because people who work for private companies don't have huge guaranteed benefits like many state employees. And that's why numerous state governments looking to achieve some kind of long-term fiscal sanity are thinking about privatizing their prisons. In Florida alone, 29 state prisons are set to be privatized by the end of the year. A move that can save the state 22 million bucks a year. It's good for the states. It's good for the prison operators. And it might even be good for the inmates since public prisons are so overcrowded. And the worse the economy gets, the more desperate the states will be to be raising money by selling their valuable prison real estate. And that's why private incarceration games game works so well during a recession. This industry is basically a duopoly. It's a duopoly between Corrections Corporation of America and Geo Group. Yeah, those are the two for all you home gamers. These are the only two significant publicly held prison firms. Both companies have a lot going for them right now, but the thing I like most is their track record during the Great Recession. Because if we get another serious slowdown, you know you can count on these guys to profit from it. Both of these companies have consistently grown earnings every year since 2007. Neither one of them fell. They didn't even feel any of the recession. Nothing. Just didn't feel it. These stocks give new meaning to the term recession proof. You, you, you can't just bust people out of prison when your state runs out of money. They gotta keep paying for inmates. And it costs about $25,000 per year, inmate per year. And the growth of the national prison population is sadly one of the strongest secular trends out there. You don't gotta like it politically, but we're not about politics here on Mad Money, right? We only care about profits. And there's no doubt this business is lucrative as all get out. It, it, it's only going to get better from here. Right now, only about 10% of prisons in the U.S. are privatized. But it's clear the country's moving in that direction. So there's a lot of room for both corrections and geo to keep on growing. Plus, the ability of governments to build new prisons is simply not keeping pace with the need for more prison space. It's simple supply and demand. The economics of the situation dictate that our new prisons will be private prisons. That is good for both CXW and geo. There's no escape from the notion that this is a fantastic business to be in. So Jim Cramer knows whereof he speaks. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the private sector prison population through 2016 has increased from under 100,000 to um, about 130,000. Um, you, if you want to have, get a sense of where they are, um, the, the, the darker the blue heading for uh, deep, deep blue is the heaviest, heaviest concentration uh, of these prisons. And if you want to compare them by state and federal, you can see the federal line is red and the state line is green. Um, most of these prisoners are in private, uh, in state prisons. And indeed, you can see here the federal, the, this red line started going down basically because the Obama administration decided to phase out private sector federal prisons. Uh, however, the Trump administration has brought them back, uh, and particularly all the, all the interdictions on the southern border, uh, almost all of that is massive business for private sector prisons. So I'm sure when we get data for the next few years, this, this red line is going to take off uh, to the northeast. While uh, some of you might have noticed a couple of weeks ago, the California state legislature just passed a bill. Uh, I don't think Governor Newsom has signed it. He was dithering about signing it, but phasing them out in California, uh, which would be, uh, I think, uh, take, a significant, make, take a significant chunk away. So what do we think about private sector prisons? Again, there's plenty of room for abuse. We all know the stories about the judges who were bribed to send children to private juvenile facilities and so on. But assume they are more efficient. So, so assume by whatever metric you think prisons should be judged, recidivism rates or conditions in the prison, let's just assume 
for the purposes of discussion, the private sector person is better. Who would still be against it? Why? Okay, that might be one reason. Yeah. The, uh, in California, the uh, private prison was, was lobbying to keep the three strikes law. So they are a strong political group to maintain the uh, incarceration rate. Okay. Any, any other reasons people might be against them? Assuming they are more efficient, what if they do have lower recidivism rates? What if they had better conditions? A lot of them don't, but why would, would you still be against them? Yes, sir? Is that really just the problem that if, if public prisons are overcrowded and private prisons would then be better, why are the public prisons better in the first place? Okay, so this goes to the lobbying question, perhaps? Um, that. Is that what is that implicit in your question, or what you're saying? Yeah, it just doesn't address the problem. It, it doesn't address. Yeah. So, Jim Cramer says the the demand is there. You're saying, well, we don't know why the demand is there. Violent crime is decreasing. Most people seem not to know that. Yeah. Well, uh, you could say, well, if we, you know, just to be the devil's advocate, if, if we said the metric by which they're going to be judged is how well they rehabilitate prisoners. What if they rehabilitate prisoners better? The question is rehabilitation of the prisoners so that they don't come back. Right, so l let's say your your next, your con renewal of your contract is going to be conditioned on the recidivism rates from your prison. I just find it interesting that we're a little more bothered by having privatized prisons, and yet we don't look at other sectors of the government, which like health or education or whatnot, where we seem a lot more prone to be okay with privatization or for profit behind these sectors. Um, that I think that is a common response, but I'm asking you why. Right, so I think because in the case of prisons, you're taking away someone's liberties, um, it hits, it affects you at the core much more. And to think that you're putting that into someone else's hands, into a private corporation's hands, it doesn't jive well with that, that idea of I'm restricting someone's freedom and I'm giving it over to the private sector. Yep, you're really going to have to yell. It disturbs this conversation around why we have these social problems, these injustices, and the high incarceration rates. Right, it doesn't address that. It takes for granted. Kramer takes for granted there's the demand, and he has nothing to say about why. You know, as we saw earlier, maybe the, it's the war on drugs, maybe it's the structural. Uh, hostility to minorities built into a lot of the, the uh, differential sentencing and enforcement. Maybe it's the, the people who should be getting mental, mental health care, not being locked up at all. Um, so we're not, by focusing on this, we're, we're not addressing the, the underlying issues. But I think coming back to um, pull the two parts of the lecture together now. What, when, when I talked at the beginning about core state functions, I mentioned Weber's definition of a state as having a, a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a given territory. That's how Weber decides, defines a state. And the truth is that um, neither of these activities, the military, 
privatizing the military or privatizing prisons re is really privatization, right? What, what it really is is contracting out um, a, gen a government monopoly. Uh, we say we're not, we're not um, actually turning uh, this over into fully private. So it's, 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 that is the problem. And as I've put up on the slide, that creates what e economists call principal agent problems of a particularly difficult sort. Because the, the idea of a principal agent problem is that w the, the, you know, the principal contracts out to the agent uh, to do things in this, either the, the military contractor or the private sector prison, but it rapidly becomes the case that the agent has more information that the principal needs to monitor the agent than the principal has. And so that creates a lot of difficult problems. Uh, so if you think about, you know, in a, a schematic view of a democracy, we have the voter, then we have the politician, politician is the voter's agent, then we have the regulator, regulator who's the politician's agent, and then we have the contractor. And so the, the chain from here to here uh, has many, many points at which we, it's a, like a, a series of nested principal agent problems that have to be managed. And of course principal agent problems come up all over the place. You say, well, what is the solution to principal agent problems? One is to, to have competition. There's not a lot of competition in any of these industries. So as Kramer noted in that clip, uh, basically the private prison industry is completely dominated by two, two corporations. And uh, this is, they have, by the way, now multinationals. They operate in Australia, they operate in Europe, they operate in the UK. Uh, they operate in lots of places. Um, there's, a, there's a huge uh, cost to entry into the private sector prison business. You've got to build a prison. You've got to commit yourself for long periods of time. Not very competitive industry. Um, military contractors, somewhat more competitive. But again, uh, you, you develop, uh, governments develop relationships with these contractors uh, they're not going to suddenly switch to other contractors very easily, uh, say contractors who might have been fighting for the other side. Um, so it's, it's actually difficult to get a lot of competition and people instead stick to the relationships that they have. A second way of managing principal agent problems is to try to better align the interests of the agent with the interests of the principal. Because if they have the same interests, then you don't have the agent going off in, in a rogue fashion doing something uh, that's not in the interest of the principal. The trouble in this area, too, it's very difficult to do that. As people pointed out with respect to the prisons, um, the, the, the industries themselves uh, have very different in incentives from uh, like reducing crime. Uh, the crime, you know, uh, having more prisoners is, is what, what is the business in which they traffic. And so, indeed, uh, what you find in the, in the prison industry is a lot of lobbying. Uh, it, it grew dramatically. Uh, this is up through 2010. If I had a slide um, since 2010, uh, it would, it would it, that number would keep going up. Uh, and you can see here they give to, uh, at the federal level, to candidates from both parties. Uh, the light blue is Republican, the dark blue is Democrats. And see, um, this is particularly when Democrats are in control of the federal government, as happened here. It's, it's going to go up. They're going to give money uh, to incumbents. So it's, they give money to both sides. Um, it won't shock you to know what they lobby for. More lockup quotas, stiffer penalties, as somebody pointed out, and immigration enforcement, because these are um, big industries. So if, if good public policy is to uh, reduce the number of people in prison, it's going to be almost impossible to align the incentives between the principal and the agent. 
Similarly, and we think about um, fighting wars, um, these, you know, we, we might say good public policy is to have fewer wars, and certainly fewer unnecessary wars. The military contractors have very different interests. So for them, if the war in Afghanistan goes on for another 10 years, it's just more business. Um, the final way in which people try to manage principal agent problems is monitoring. Um, but that is very difficult in these types of circumstances. Here's a hearing. So today we're continuing our oversight on the United States government contracting on conflicts overseas. Uh, we're going to ask the important questions, who's getting the United States taxpayer money, uh, and how are they using those funds once they get it. Last week, uh, this subcommittee held a hearing that examined the investigation into the host nation trucking contract in Afghanistan. That investigation uncovered distressing details of how the United States taxpayer money is funding warlordism and corruption in Afghanistan and how the contract is undermining United States counterinsurgency strategy. Equally troubling is the finding that the United States officials charged with overseeing this contract had no visibility into the actual operations of the contractors and subcontractors. In most cases, officials did not know who the subcontractors were, let alone who they employed, how they functioned, and where they spent their money. To give one example, seven of the eight prime contractors in the host nation trucking contract employed, either directly or indirectly, a man by the name of Commander Ruhula, and he provides security for the supply convoys. Commander Ruhula claims to spend one and a half million dollars per month on ammunition, and has reportedly attacked convoys that do not use his security services. Still, no United States military officials have ever met with Commander Ruhula, and despite the fact that he receives millions of dollars of taxpayer money, there have been no attempts to enforce the United States laws that govern his U.S.-funded contractual relationship. With $2.16 billion of taxpayer funds at stake, it's unconscionable that the military does not have tighter control over host nation trucking subcontractors. But the host nation trucking contract is not the only problem. This week's Economist reports that 570 NATO contracts worth millions of dollars were issued in southern Afghanistan, but nobody is quite sure to whom. In January, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, one of our witnesses here today, issued a report about a State Department contract with DynCorp, which noted that, and I quote, over $2.5 billion in U.S. funds were vulnerable to waste and fraud, close quote. In May, the Inspector General for the United States Agency for International Development issued an audit of his private security contractors in Afghanistan, which highlighted significant problems with USAID contracts. It found that USAID does not have, and I quote again, reasonable assurance that private security contractors are reporting all serious security incidents, are suitably qualified, and are authorized to operate in Afghanistan, close quote. Audits from the Department of State, USAID, and others have found problems with subcontractor management in areas as diverse as embassy construction, fuel delivery, and educational outreach programs. The Government Accountability Office, another of our witnesses here today, has reported that the agencies are not even able to accurately report the number of contractor and subcontractor personnel working on United States contracts. And just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that over $3 billion in cash has been flown out of Afghanistan in the last three years. It's $3 billion of cash on a plane flying out of Afghanistan. Officials believe that at least some of that money has been skimmed from United States contracts and aid projects. So, uh, and this, this sort of hearing, you, you can find them, you know, a dime a dozen uh, on YouTube. And it's it, extremely difficult, if you think about the kind of combat situations we're discussing, for the um, principals to have the kind of information that they need to monitor the agents, particularly uh, problematic in Afghanistan, even when there were only uh, 14,000 security contractors, um, you can see Unlike in Iraq, almost all of them were local Afghans for reasons we've already talked about, which creates the even bigger information asymmetry because the agents have so much better knowledge than do the principals. And so uh, the, the actual, this is to, I took this out of the case and you can work through it uh, at, at your leisure, but this is just the Defense Department's um, chain of monitoring uh, in, in Afghanistan down to the host nation trucking. And you can see 
both the managing and the reviewing of the contract has multiple steps. And then, there, of course, some of these are controlled also by the State Department, which had a whole different set as well. So suffice to say, um, monitoring is very difficult. Uh, very similar story in the prison industry that the, the information you need, thing, it's all very well to say, well, we could use recidivism rates, but they don't show up for very long periods of time. And uh, when, you, you know, when a prisoner comes to a parole hearing and, uh, and the parole officer says, has the prisoner been behaving? Uh, if the guard who's there knows that if that prisoner leaves, the cell is going to be empty and it's going to affect the bottom line, uh, very difficult uh, uh, to monitor that sort of um, uh, problem. And so you could just multiply those sorts of uh, problems um, by a, a, a huge number, and you can see that monitoring uh, is difficult in that area as well, but we're out of time, and we will talk in, on Tuesday about money and politics.